webinar called Creating a Resilient Feedback Culture with Sarah Rosenthula. My name is Dash and I'm a marketing manager here at Impraise and today we're going to cover the topic of difficult conversations not needing to be so difficult. So over to you Sarah and thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much Dash and um, a very warm welcome to you listening in, looking into this webinar on creating a resilient feedback culture. So delighted to share with you uh, some of my, well, my passion for better communication and my expertise. So you can see here, here are some of the client organizations that I've had the privilege of working in and I might be sharing some stories from working in these organizations. I'm a business psychologist by background and it's great to be witnessing really uh, a real surge of interest in how to give good feedback, how to create uh, a productive work environment, how to align a whole system so that it becomes a vibrant, energizing, engaging place for people to work. And uh, I've also written about this topic. Uh, you can see my book there, it's called Life Changing Conversations. So, uh, what this slide doesn't tell you, if you like, is the more informal side of my background. And I'm going to cover that quickly because it um, relates to this whole topic of giving one another feedback. And here we've got a picture of me. This is a good 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I spent several years uh, working as a street circus performer. And in this photo here, I'm actually juggling three knives uh, over the top of a, uh, a volunteer from the crowd. And the reason I'm sharing this is because when you do street circus, you get pretty instant feedback on how you're performing. And that comes from whether people stay or walk away, whether they clap or don't, what the quality of the heckling is like. And uh, in the four years I did this, um, just even on a... On a Let's say an economic level it was interesting I went from earning about five pounds an hour to earning about 200 pounds an hour uh, doing wow. street shows based on just responding to feedback listening to the feedback sure perfecting technical skills as well but this is the difference that acting on feedback can make it can make an enormous difference to results um, mm -hmm. of course our concern here is with um, the results in a business environment uh, but uh, yeah we we'll see that in different contexts so um, I'm sure you might recognize a couple of the faces here if there's any Strictly Come Dancing fans so uh, here's Darcy Bustle with Len Goodman and uh, just wanted to touch on um, Something Darcy Bustle said, because I think it really points to the feedback that we need to cultivate to be able to receive and indeed give productive feedback. Um, you might know Darcy Bustle, you know, a British ballerina, performed with the Royal Ballet for over two decades. And here's something that she said about performance and training as a ballerina taught me to use criticism constructively if the teachers weren't giving you criticism it meant they didn't think you had potential and so what we see here is a real openness and a positive attitude towards receiving feedback and i just want to acknowledge at the outset this can be delicate and difficult territory but to the extent that we can go into the topic with a positive mindset, it really helps. And um, as Darsh said earlier, difficult conversations don't have to be difficult. And I hope some of what this webinar will give you are some tools and shifts in mindset that might help you lean into having some of those conversations around giving one another feedback that really enhance well-being and performance at work. So we are seeing around the world many different organizations being interested in creating resilient feedback cultures. Uh, Virgin Trains is an organization I've done a lot of work in uh, on their, they called it conversational leadership. And in other organizations I've also worked at PwC and EY 
And I think organisations and leaders are increasingly recognising that having access to good quality feedback is a key way of improving performance and business results. And we see this in organisations such as Patagonia, EY, purpose-driven organisations mm -hmm. that really want to achieve their best potential and making the most of creating a feedback culture. And so what I hope you'll get from this webinar is um, are some tools that will help you to create a resilient feedback culture in your organisation and indeed some shifts in mindset as well. And Sarah, just to that point, this is for everyone in the organisation, isn't it? You don't have to be the CEO to make a change. No, not at all. This, um, these um, shifts in mindset, these tools could be used by anybody, any team member in an organisation. Excellent. Great if we've got buy-in from the top and senior leaders are really role modelling this, but yeah, it could apply um, across the organisation. Fabulous. And so what I hope you'll get then from the webinar is really a deeper understanding that could be summarised by saying that just great leaders are great learners, or we could say great team members are great learners. And as I say, we're going to be looking at what's the mindset we need to cultivate so that we give, um, sorry, sorry, we receive feedback constructively and we give feedback productively. And we're going to be looking at both sides here. And so I'm going to do in a moment a little bit more context setting about what great feedback is and why it matters. And then we'll be looking at those two sides of the feedback process, the uh, receiving of it and the giving of it. So um, you might want to pause in a moment and just think about this for yourself. Um, and it's, this is an exercise you could actually do on your own if you like. So I'd like you to just bring to mind a piece of helpful feedback that you've received. And I'd also like you to think about some unhelpful feedback that you've been on the receiving end of. And so if you just bring that to mind. Do you have any examples of a piece of feedback yourself that you may have received or not so helpful feedback, Zero? Sure. Uh, well, a not so helpful one was uh, a, a comment that was written as part of a 360 degree feedback process where somebody wrote the comment, Sarah lacks edge. <laughs> and I read that comment and I thought, uh, well, I wonder what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I actually translate that into a change in behavior? I didn't really know what it meant. Right. And so that wasn't particular. It made me stop and think, but it wasn't helpful because it didn't really help me change my behaviour. And a more helpful piece of feedback was when a participant on a leadership programme gave me the feedback and said, when you uh, stop and invite the quieter people in the group, who contribute because we've maybe not heard from them yet it really helps me feel included and it makes me feel I belong uh, in this group and I think I've done it a couple of times but this particular participant was saying can you do more of that oh that's great and it was um, it was a helpful piece of feedback and I've used it I've borne it in mind many times doing mm -hmm. group invitations since excellent so yeah, just in terms of bringing these pieces of feedback to mind, you might think about how it made you feel, what happened as a result. And so that brings us to this question then, what is constructive feedback? Feedback can come in many forms, as I'm sure you're aware. And um, just before answering that question, I'm just going to sort of step back a moment and refer to some research done by a British organisation called Blueprint for Better Business. And in their survey carried out in uh, the summer of 2017, they found that about 20% of us avoid giving challenging feedback. Mm -hmm. And a quarter of us worry that the feedback won't land well. So we uh, hold back from giving people messages that might actually make a real difference to them sometimes. 
And Blueprint also found that over half of us in the workplace don't receive any feedback at all. So, you know, I think if these are the patterns, mm -hmm. then that means that there's some real missed opportunity here for improving performance and self-awareness through giving each other feedback. I think feedback and creating a resilient feedback culture can make a real difference, mm -hmm. uh, but it also needs to be done right. So there have been some articles recently coming out, including an article in the Harvard Business Review uh, I think it's called something like Why Feedback Fails. And some organisations who've been really moving away from the annual once a year performance appraisal review have almost sort of tipped it too far the other way, <laughs> whereby, you know, there's so much feedback being given, but without real due attention being paid to how the feedback's being given. Mm -hmm then that has uh, created a culture um, that, well, the Wall Street Journal um, wrote about this recently and we're reflecting on the culture at Netflix and we're describing it as intense and awkward mm -hmm. because feedback was given in a way that wasn't really sensitive to how people were feeling. Right. Um, there was a lack of psychological safety for people, so a sense that it's maybe not okay to make mistakes, and we all make mistakes. Um, that's part of being human. And so it's really important, I think, to attend to how feedback is both received and given in order to make the most of it. And so constructive feedback, if we keep it really simple, I think it's about these three things in particular. You could call this the ABC of good feedback. So first of all, it's actionable. So we can actually do something with it. Um, we um, can work out how we might need to change our behavior, for example. So it's behaviorally focused and it's considered and by considered, uh, it could be that it's given to us in a way that um, where somebody's picked their moment really well to give us the feedback. So, for example, if we've just delivered a presentation and we've done lots of things well, but there's one or two things that could be improved upon, somebody waits maybe 24 hours or a day or two before giving us that feedback rather than giving it us in the heat of the moment when we've just sort of stepped off the stage so just mm -hmm. so considered in terms of timing and we'll come to this a little bit later maybe considered in terms of the actual words that are spoken as well absolutely and also just to uh, lay out that there are two types of feedback and I've learned this from working with sports psychologists where uh, in a sporting context, they talk about motivational feedback. So that's the feedback. It makes us feel great. It inspires and encourages us. And then there's the developmental feedback that is more challenging and stretching for us. And to improve performance and raise self-awareness and make us a better team player, we need both types of feedback. And there's some research that suggests, and this is coming out of the whole field of positive psychology, that there's um, a ratio of five to one that, so and this is saying that for every piece of developmental feedback, uh, it's good to get five pieces of motivational feedback. And that in high performing teams, there's actually a really expansive, buoyant atmosphere Mm -hmm. Whereas in low performing teams, what we see sometimes are quite rigid dynamics. There's real cynicism. Um, if somebody, for example, makes a sarcastic comment that really hangs around in the air and yeah. it's the atmosphere. Yeah. So actually attending to this ratio, but also I think just the tone in which things are said really makes a difference um, in teams and organizations. And again, we're back to building that resilient culture that enables really good levels of performance. Mm -hmm. 
And so let's take a look at being on the receiving end of feedback that will go there first. And I want you just to think back to those pieces of feedback that you received that were helpful, unhelpful, and you might just check in with yourself about the mindset you were in when you received that feedback. How was it for you? And uh, I know even though I've worked as a business psychologist for many, many years, if I get an email or somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, can I give you some feedback? You know, I can still have, um, you know, a sort of racing heart and slightly yeah. arms because it can be challenging. You know, but, yeah. Was this back to your point before when you said considered as sometimes when you're about to deliver a piece of information, considering what the mindset the person might be in who is receiving the feedback and they might have just had a really bad meeting or they might have been really busy with something. So thinking about that when you're, when you're delivering the feedback as well as how you feel receiving the feedback. Absolutely. It's a, that's a really good point to just, yeah, think about the state of mind somebody might be in, you know, to mm -hmm. the extent that somebody's feeling well resourced yeah. and well supported, then they're going to be more open to what we have to say. Yeah. And so, uh, and again, I've, I've learned this from um, sports psychologists, that there's often um, a series of emotions that we go through when we receive feedback. And just as you were saying there about the timing, it can also be helpful to bear this in mind when we're either giving somebody feedback or receiving feedback ourselves, that sometimes the reaction uh, initially is one of shock. Uh, mm -hmm. I've known business leaders where my job's been to go in and help them digest the results of 360 degree feedback and they've had the report but I remember one leader telling me that he tossed it in the back of his car uh, and didn't want to look at it for two weeks uh, <laughs> until he was in a way uh, had to by having a coaching conversation mm -hmm. and so whether we're conscious of it or not sometimes it can really uh, it can be quite confrontative having feedback and yeah. people go into a state of shock uh, or indeed anger or denial and people don't want to, they just discount it or don't want to look at it. Uh, some people rationalise it and say, oh, well, that person doesn't really know what they're talking about. How on earth can they um, assess my assertiveness or right. whatever? Uh, but actually, what we also find, particularly when people are supported through the process, through um, supportive conversations, whether that's with a colleague or a coach or indeed a trusted friend, that people can get to a place of acceptance and then ideally renewed action around what their feedback is telling them. But there is an emotional journey. So <laughs> it's helpful to bear that in mind. Absolutely. So in terms of what helps um, in to, with receiving feedback, I think and so I think um, assuming positive intent makes the real difference if we just think that you know maybe there's a, a grain of truth in here or maybe there's something that there is for me to learn. I think acknowledging that we do all have blind spots. And it's quite humbling sometimes to discover that what has taken us a long time to see for ourselves is mm -hmm. quite obvious to other people. Yeah. Better that we realise these things. So just, yeah, um, accepting that. Um, not taking it personally. In a way, it's uh, easier said than done because it is feedback about you um, but I think if you can see it as feedback about your behavior or how you're coming across um, that can help bring a certain degree of healthy detachment mm -hmm. if you put it like this this isn't the truth about you so much as one person's perception of you and I think it also helps if we keep our focus on the future and ask ourselves, well, what's the feedback really telling me 
about um, my performance, how I'm coming across, how can I use it to um, be more engaged and energized in my work. It sometimes helps to ask for clarification. So for example, going back to that piece of feedback about lacking edge, um, you know, if I'd have had the opportunity to um, be able to, I could have asked questions like, so what does that mean? You know, in what contexts do you see me lacking edge? Is that in client facing situations or in which particular team? What would you like me to see? What would you like to see me doing more of? Is that asking questions or disagreeing and so on? So clarification can be helpful and finally I really think it helps to remember that uh, as I've put here you are the ultimate authority on you and what I mean by that is even with for example a 360 degree feedback report where you've had lots of data and maybe lots of verbatim comments you get to decide what all that means. You might be looking for some general themes or patterns in that data and deciding what that actually means for you as a leader or as a team member. And I think, you know, retaining that sovereignty, if you like, is, is really important here. So let's move on to, then to this next part around how to give feedback productively. And uh, here what we're doing is we're going to take a look in particular at the more developmental feedback rather than the motivational feedback. I'm going to give you a particular tool uh, to think about. I'm going to encourage you to have a go at using it. And just to say that you could use this tool as well for giving somebody motivational feedback, but I'm going to focus in particular on the developmental side because that's where people generally find it more challenging. Yeah. And so, um, yep, just before going there, uh, because this, uh, the tool I'm going to give you chimes with an article that came out very recently in The Guardian. Uh, so a feedback with a rather provocative title by Oliver Berkman called Why Feedback is Never Worthwhile. But actually, if you read this article, um, yeah, we understand that this whole notion of feedback and the role it plays in improving performance is a real hot topic. And as it says in the subheading here, it's not about telling others what you think of their skills, so much of really describing your own experience of their work, your own experience of how they impact you, how you feel um, around them. And so what we're seeing here, again, is just a real awareness about how to give good feedback. And uh, here's a quote from Neil Donald Walsh, who's a best-selling author, and uh, he wrote this in the foreword to my book, where he put, speak your truth, but soothe your words with peace. And I, I like this quote because I think it points to getting the balance right between being direct um, and giving messages that are clear and clean. Uh, but also being sensitive about how those messages, how that feedback is delivered. So you might have your own way of expressing that, Neil's way, is to say soothe your words with peace, but really to just think about the impact on the other person. Uh, in Back into that Guardian article for a moment, they're pointing to feedback cultures where I think the word they use is there's a bit of a swagger going on. <laughs> in terms of how the feedback is delivered as if you know i'm the expert on you um and you know it doesn't have to be like that we can give feedback in a way that really takes the other person and um their well-being into account as well and so again just a, an opportunity for you to gather your thoughts for a moment so you might like to think about a piece of developmental feedback challenging feedback 
that you'd like to give somebody or perhaps you even need to give somebody um, perhaps that's somebody in your team or it might be somebody in your wider environment you could indeed think of somebody in your personal life if you like and the next question to ask yourself actually is what would be the benefit uh, particularly to them and in particular how would it help them to thrive and excel because I think this should really always be the intent of giving somebody feedback so you know never to put somebody down or to big ourselves up but you know that intent to really help the other person and so in a way we're challenging ourselves first to make sure we're coming from that place before we lean in and have that conversation and before we do there's also a piece of preparation that we can do that helps us to have these difficult conversations so this is the tool um, that i'm going to give you but actually i'm just going to go back for a moment and just tell you a brief story about when i was on the receiving end of this particular tool um, because i think it would help bring it alive and then I'll take you through the tool itself and there's going to be the opportunity for you to work this through in your own setting. So a uh, brief bit of context here, uh, This I was working on a team it's a little while ago with uh, a number of other consultants, we were running a leadership program and it was my responsibility to draw together the manual for the program which involved a lot of writing we divided it up and one of the consultants didn't deliver their uh, text on time and i was in a tight spot i had a deadline to meet and so i went to a colleague very good writer um good friends and asked him at rather short notice if he wouldn't mind uh, writing various pages for this leadership manual and he very kindly did he sent me across the writing i sent the file to the printers and as far as i was concerned big sigh of relief job done but actually what happened was my colleague he's called cliff uh, when i saw him a couple of months later he um took me to one side and asked me if i had a moment and if now was a good time to have a chat and then he said to me something along the lines of um sarah when you asked me to write those 10 pages of text with only three days notice uh, I I felt mad uh, so angry he's American and um, I assumed that you were leaning on our friendship to get the job done and what I'd really have liked to have had happened is that you went and spoke to the original consultant you'd asked to do the writing to uh, get him to have done it because there's a pattern of him not delivering and that needs addressing. And if you ask me to do that again, I would like at least a week's notice. It's pretty fair. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> um, and so there was more to the conversation, but that was the essence of what um, Cliff communicated to me. And I just want to share with you here that there are a couple of uncomfortable moments um, in hearing that for me, particularly the uh, that I his perception was I was leaning on the friendship to get it done, and that was an ouch for me because I think there was some truth in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, that uh, feedback conversation really helped to deepen our working relationship, and uh, we remain um, in very good touch we've worked together many times since and it's deepened trust because i really know that if cliff has something to tell me um because i have my blind spots too then he is going to tell me that and so there's an example of a piece of feedback that actually improved a relationship because it helped clear the air and I'm also going to acknowledge that Cliff is a skilled communicator and I'll t talk you through the structure of how he actually gave me that feedback. And this does require a certain degree of maturity. Um, yeah. And 
I also I think that's something that we can all cultivate actually if we're willing just to you know and it could just be 10 minutes take 10 minutes to prepare think about what we need to say think about the impact on the other person I think we're all actually capable of delivering feedback um, that can have a positive impact and so this particular tool I call I call it speak your truth often um, so where the O stands for observations so that's where Cliff started he started with the data with the facts with things that you could have video recorded you know, when you asked me to write you know, 10 pages in three days I felt and he said mad and he actually named the feeling so there's the F in often and difficult conversations are often about difficult feelings that does not mean we act out those feelings uh, in the moment but we do name them and own them and actually that helps settle them by just including them and acknowledging that they're there and then the third part of often the thoughts or the assumptions and Cliff very clearly laid that out and again he owned it he did have a judgment of me um, and because he made it clear we could then look at it together and uh, I in that particular case I agreed that there was some truth in that and then the final part he expressed his needs uh, what he wanted to have happen what he wanted to be different in the future some of you might be familiar with nonviolent communication that wonderful body of work and uh, Marshall Rosenberg talks about how sometimes when there are difficulties in communication it's because we have unmet needs mm -hmm. so actually challenging ourselves to think about unmet needs can be good prep to do as well and that might be a need for acknowledgement or more time or an apology or whatever it is and uh, of course conversation is a two-way thing so just ask yeah. what you think yeah, on to that point do you think it was considered by cliff to wait a little bit longer to then be able to distinguish the feeling and not be mad in the moment he told you the feedback but he gave himself time considered what he wanted to say and then was able to just state the emotion as opposed to live the emotion at the time yeah very i do i think the timing did play a part in it i mean we were sort of on different continents so he in his case he waited until we were face to face and in person but yeah the, the heat had gone out of the moment and um yeah he could name it without acting it out perfect so that's our often tool and you can download uh, this handout for yourselves and write your own responses and if you have got a partner to work with that could be a work colleague or uh, somebody you trust then I would actually encourage you once you've written out a possible response to often for yourself then actually say the words out loud to somebody and yeah ask for some feedback how, how are you coming across and um, just you know having a, a dry run can actually really help us as well and so um, let's just start drawing things together then in terms of some key messages about creating a resilient feedback culture um, it really does need to be done well uh, it's not enough just to be out there giving people feedback but actually you know thinking about um, how we both give and receive feedback uh, it is how we thrive, it is how we grow as team members, as leaders. And I think that when we're able to do that skillfully and with a degree of maturity, it can make a real difference to how individuals, teams and organisations function. Um, just a few more how-tos for leaders or indeed any team members really wanting to give feedback um, I think it's really important to role model what you're expecting other people to do. So, for example, it's really powerful to see a leader not just ask for feedback, but to listen to it mm -hmm. um, and then be seen to act on it as well. 
And I think that then creates the impetus and the inspiration for other team members to do the same. But I don't think we can expect other people to do what we're not prepared to do ourselves. I think creating the conditions where feedback can be shared um, is really important. So this touches back on psychological safety, where people feel um, that it's okay to make themselves vulnerable. So for example, you might have a team where people share what they're learning about their strengths, but they also share what they're learning about their development needs or the goals that they're setting themselves. And that does make us feel vulnerable. Um, and so, you know, anything that a leader can do to help create those conditions is powerful. So, for example, a leader might say, well, I'll go first. Yeah. I'll be the first to share my 360 results and what I'm taking away from that to just help create that type of environment. Yeah. I think it also helps to for for ourselves and also for others to see that there are both risks and benefits of having the conversation and indeed of staying silent. And I'm not advocating here that we always have the difficult conversation. You know, there are times to let sleeping dogs lie or there are times where we just decide to press the pause button and have that conversation a bit further down the line, for example, where somebody is in a stronger place. Mm -hmm. um, but I really do think that we need to take a good look at what the risks are of not saying anything or not giving that piece of feedback, because often people don't look at those risks. And what happens if we don't make a conscious decision is that sometimes resentments fester or performance stagnates um, or a relationship which isn't in a great place anyway just gets worse and worse. So the risks of staying silent can be significant and it's good to just acknowledge that. Um, and, and finally, we can give feedback um, on multiple different levels, really. So we focused here particularly on individuals feeding back to individuals. Uh, and that does help build a resilient culture. Uh, one of the things that Margaret Heffernan says in her writing, she's a writer um, and CEO, is that cultures are non-linear systems. And what that means is that they're sensitive to tiny tweaks. So actually, if you enable these one-to-one -one conversations to happen more often, that makes a difference. As does, for example, a senior leadership team going out to the organization and asking for feedback on um, a recent corporate event or a recent piece of marketing uh, and actually gathering wisdom from different, from across the organization. Yeah. And you might also get teams giving each other feedback as well on what's working well or even better if to really help create this culture of, um, of feedback that enables performance. Yeah, that's a really great saying you just used right at the end there, the two questions of even better if to kind of focus on the future, as you say, and the positive elements that can come from it as opposed to looking at it from a negative point of view to say you did something wrong, um, which I really like. Instead of going, what did I do wrong? You focus the attention on what can I do better next time. That's it, yeah. Yeah, and I saw it with a, a team recently where within one team there were actually three sub-teams. And we had a fantastic session where we used exactly that frame, the even better ear from what's working well and the sub teams are giving each other feedback. And that's really helped um, that team improve their performance. Absolutely. Good. So there's lots more about all of this in my book. So uh, you'll find the Speak Your Truth Often tools and you'll find more about making conscious decisions about whether to have the conversation or stay silent. So there's lots more resources there for you to draw on if you're interested. 
And um, yeah, I, if you'd like to ask any questions, Dash, you're very welcome. Yeah, thank, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time to record this. And I'm sure people who continue to listen to this in time coming will get value out of it no matter what. For everyone listening, we will include the link to Sarah's book below as well if you want to find the very useful insights that she has. Um, and I do just have one question because I know it's been 40 minutes already. So just quickly, um, do you have any suggestions on how you can measure feedback? Because as you say, there's things that everybody can do, but how are they able to show that that's working or it's not working or it's growing or anything along the lines of? Yeah. Well, happy to share a couple of thoughts and then please add in um, any thoughts from your side because, of course, when feedback is digitally enabled, then that's going to help uh, metrics to be produced more easily. Some of the metrics could be really simple, actually, in terms of measurement. So, for example, you might measure how many times team members ask for feedback. Yep. Um, you know, there is this movement away from just the annual performance review. So, for example, if you're wanting to create a culture like they're doing at Patagonia, um, the company that sells outdoor clothing and goods, where they're going more for the monthly check-in, mm -hmm. you could actually measure how many team members are having the monthly check-in. You could be asking people to set themselves goals based on the feedback you could then be surveying people uh, around progress against those goals uh, and creating performance metrics in that way yeah absolutely i really like your points that you made there with increasing frequency so um moving from the annual process to the by biannual process or even monthly the other one i really like there is to your point to switching it from people asking for feedback as well as giving feedback so if teams or individuals are enabled to go into a tool such as Impraise or any tool that you might use and actively ask for feedback. For example, if you've just given the presentation and you say, you know, do you have any insights on how I did? Uh, that's live, it's tangible, it's contextualized and that's, and then when it's documented over the year, as a leader coming back to the review cycle, you can look at those pieces of feedback and, just, and see because sometimes as humans, you cannot remember what you do throughout the entire year. So shifting the frequency and uh, the ability to ask in your own time as well is really great um, insight. So as you said, um, Impraise can help with all of the above, but I won't take any more time. So thank you, Sarah, and we will share all the information and the links you mentioned as well. Great. Thank you very much, Dash. Pleasure to talk with you. Thank you.